Um, I am Matt Farley, uh, an accessibility consultant for World Campus. And I'm Sonia Woods. I'm also an accessibility consultant for World Campus. I've been in this role for about seven years. And um, we, so our job is to make courses, online courses in particular, accessible. Matt and I have co-authored a faculty development course called OL2600, which is authoring in the Canvas environment. So thank you for joining our session today. Um, when we wrote our course, we did not have the You Do It tool available. It's, a, it's an accessibility checker tool that will check your entire course. So in our session today, we're going to start with planning for diversity and illustrate the different needs that people have by using our personas. And then Matt's going to demonstrate the You Do It tool for you. And then I'm going to demonstrate the built-in Canvas accessibility checker. And then we're going to compare the two tools. They have different strengths and weaknesses. So these seven people are fictional people. Um, there are world campus personas of students with disabilities. So they are, they're not real people, but they are based on data about our world, world campus students, both qualitative and quantitative data, so that they do accurately represent real populations of people. And we use them in our training just to help people understand the variable needs that people have, not just people with disabilities, but all people. So I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to talk, talk about all seven. We do have a website you can go to where you can read about how we made them and all seven in depth. I'm just going to highlight a few of them for you today. So I'm going to start with Sean. And can you bring up his page? Yeah. So Sean is completely blind. He navigates the web and uses computer software by using an assistive technology, which is screen reading software, which has been added to his computer. So if you wanted to use your computer without your monitor or your mouse, you could install screen reading software. He uses JAWS and then you would hear uh, audio instructions that would tell you where you are, um, that would help you navigate your computer and the web to go to the websites you want to look at, do the things you need to do. And a lot of what defines accessible practice is what Sean needs, because if content creators don't intentionally create an, uh, accessible content, Sean will have a hard time navigating and understanding what's on the page. For instance, if you can see on this, on his page, there are several headings, goal, bio, frustrations, works best when. Those headings help us visually scan and see what's on this page. Since Sean can't see those, they need to be marked up as headings so that his screen reader software recognizes them. And then he can bring up a list and he can read each of those headings and that helps him understand what's on the page and how to get where he wants to go. So good heading structure is um, a foundational accessible practice. He also needs links to be um, meaningful. So if he, he can bring up a list of links and arrow through and he hears the link text read to him and if the links are all here or click here or read more, he doesn't know where those are going. And if it's a big long URL string, that's just going to sound like noise. Um, so meaningful links are important for Sean. If there is table data presented, then he needs the table to have a caption and to have header rows specified. So we're going to show you how these accessibility tools are going to help you to make your content um, the way Sean needs it to be to work for him. He also would need, if you use images, he would need those to be described. And um, I think that's what I want to say about Sean. So if you can bring up Phil's page. Now, Phil has low vision and traumatic brain injury, which means that he has some vision, but he relies on magnification in order to read and to make sense of complex visual information. 
he prefers to use a mobile device because the interface is simpler and he has accessibility features built on in to his tablet and his smartphone. He likes to look at content on his tablet so he can pinch and zoom in on the detail. So that's part of why um, making sure content is mobile friendly is a big, is just um, right in line with accessible practice. So in his case, because he can see, he doesn't really need images to be described, but he does need them to be high quality and um, he needs good color contrast. So the tools we're going to show you do check for color contrast. And then the last one is Jenna. Um, Jenna has ADHD, so she can see and hear and use a mouse. But she also, uh, she struggles with mental focus and short-term memory and executive function. So when we add in good heading structure, meaningful link text, um, provide a text alternative for a complex visual. All of these help Jenna to learn as well. Um, video captions are very helpful for her um, and Phil. Anybody that watching a video with the captions on helps with mental focus. Andy is our persona who is deaf, so he relies on captions. And so we'll show you what these two tools will do in terms of um, pointing out video content as well. So, so Matt, I think um, you can go on to the demo part. Okay, so um, if first off, you're not familiar with the You Do It tool, it is something that's available in any Canvas course space, but you do first have to enable it in the settings. So you'll just want to go to your settings and in the navigation tab, um, just find it in the list of disabled pages and drag that up uh, to the course navigation menu. Um, and just so you know this, in case you're worried, this is not something that will be available to students. So students won't be able to run a, an accessibility check on your course. Um, this is just something that you'll be able to see in your role. Uh, so once it's there, uh, when you go to the tool, it provides you with some information at the top about what the tool is and what it looks for. So if you're not familiar with it, um, it stands for the Universal Design Online Content Inspection Tool. And this was created uh, by a team at the University of Central Florida. So it's a, an accessibility checker tool that will scan various aspects of your Canvas space um, and check for some common accessibility errors. And then we'll also look for things that it calls suggestions, which are more issues that it, it might detect there's a possible problem, but it either is not a critical error or it actually might not be able to have enough information um, to tell. So it'll point you in the right direction and say, take a look at this page. There might be um, a way you could improve this, but you might have to do a little more investigation on your own. So those are the two categories that breaks things into. Errors are more hard and fast rules where it can say, this is definitely a problem and here's how you fix it. Um, and just to give you a reminder of that, there's a link at the top where it'll, it'll bring up this box that will show you kind of everything it checks for and then provide you with more information on each of those with examples. So links should contain link text. It'll give you uh, the reason why that's important and some additional resources if you would like to learn more about that. And then it will show you what an incorrect and a correct example looks like uh, in the code. So within the link tags here, um, there's one that has no link text and then one that does. So you can investigate that on your own. It's, this is just a useful bit of information, especially if you're unfamiliar with some of these concepts, just to educate yourself a little bit about what some of the common accessibility issues might be um, in, in online content. So once you have that set up, you can choose what it actually scans for. So you can choose whether or not it will look at unpublished content in your course. Um, I'm gonna uncheck that for demo purposes. And then you can choose which areas it actually scans. So whether it's just looking at pages or files or discussions, assignments. Um, you probably don't wanna run all that at once, especially if it's a really big course. So I would recommend unchecking select all. Um, and for this demo, we're just gonna do the pages we have. And you can also choose whether you want it to show errors or suggestions or both. Um, I'd recommend just showing both. Um, 
And then another thing to point out is after you run a scan, you can go back and select view old reports and look at previous scans you've run on the course. Um, once, once you go to an old report, you can't change anything from there, but it's a good way to, if you wanna kind of continue updating your cor course and track your progress to see where things stand, um, hopefully you'll be seeing the numbers of errors uh, reducing as you're fixing some of these things. Um, but we'll do a fresh scan right now. Depending on the size of the course, it could take a few minutes. I think this one should just take a few seconds. Okay, so then it will bring up the report. Um, it'll give you a summary at the top where it will show you the list of errors and list of suggestions it found. Um, this is good just from a top level perspective to see what some of the immediate problems might be, but um, this area doesn't uh, really tell you where these issues are, or how to fix them. So you wanna actually go down and move into the specific pages. Um, and just so there's not any confusion, these are not categories that it has broken issues into. Like these are not all color errors here. These are actually just the names of specific pages we've made in Canvas um, for the purpose of like example content. So each of these is the name of a page in your course. Um, this one at the top is the home page. Um, so this actually is an interesting example. When you expand these, it'll show you uh, what the error is. So it's saying there's insufficient text color contrast with the background. Um, it'll say text color should be easily viewable and should not be the only indicator of meaning or function. Color balance should have at least a 4.5 to one ratio for small text and so on. So it, this is, it tells you the issue, it describes it, and then you can actually select view the source of this issue and it will show you in the code where that issue is. Um, it gives you also a preview. So it's picking up this white text here on a white background and it's, it's showing that that's not enough contrast to see this text here, which is go to class. Um, the reason why I say this is an interesting issue is because if you actually go to this page, um, it's picking up this go to class text on this blue button. It's just scanning the, um, the HTML on the page and it's not detecting that this, it's not able to pick up the fact that this text is actually overlaid on this, this button component here. So that's actually an example of like a false, um, positive, I think would, what it would be. So I, I just want to make that point to say, just because you see an error listed here, it might not a hundred percent of the time actually be a problem, which is why it's always good not to just, um, fix it without further investigation. It's a good idea, even though they pull out the code here, go look at the page and actually see where that is within the context of the page, because there are examples like this where it might not actually be an issue. Um, but if that was an issue, say that was on a white background, you can fix it right from the report here. So you just select the you fix it button. And for a color contrast issue, it'll give you this tool here where you can actually select a different color for that text. And it will show you a preview of what that color looks like against the background. Um, it'll even give you like the hex color code for that if you want it. And you can even select lighten or darken it from here if you wanna find a similar color um, across the, the color palette. So that's how you would um, fix a color contrast issue. And it will, it'll let you know when you've, um, if you've chosen one that will meet the, the standards. Uh, so moving on, we have an example page of image errors. Um, and this has picked up a couple of different issues. So this first issue is saying alternate text should not be the file name. If we look at the preview of this, um, and we look in the code, the alt text here is vacation.jpg. Um, when you add an image to Canvas, it usually just puts the file name as the default alt text if you don't choose, change anything. So that's an issue where you would want to click the you fix it button and put in a uh, new alt text here, sunset over the ocean, um, and select submit to actually fix that within the page itself. If it's a purely decorative image that doesn't need alt text at all, you could instead check this mark image as decorative um, and that will just take all the alt text away from the image completely. Um, this is another image alt text issue. The second one here, it is saying that the image alt text is too long. Um, this is an area, a little bit of a gray area. We usually recommend alt text isn't longer than like 120 characters or so. But if you have something that's like 130, it's gonna, pick that up as an error, we're really, um, that's not a huge deal. But if you are 
you know, if it's detecting something that's paragraphs and paragraphs long, that might be an example where the d image needs either a more concise description or if it really requires all that text, the description might want to be provided in a different format, whether that's within the context of the page or in a separate Word document, if it's like a chart and you need to provide a table as an alternative for that, um, that would be an area where you, you wouldn't necessarily be um, able to just put everything in the alt attribute of the image itself. So that will, that will key you in on any images that might have alt text that's too long. <clears throat> um, so for link text, I, I already showed this example. Um, it, it picks up if you have a link that's just the URL with no link text at all. Um, so that's one where you would want to add in new link text. Uh, if for some reason that's a link that doesn't even need to be there, it, it gives you the option here to delete that link entirely. And then it will also detect if link text is there, but it's not descriptive enough. So this one is Picking up, again, it's just a URL. Um, the second example is more interesting. It's picking up the fact that the link text is just click here. Now, I believe that the you do it tool will only pick up very specific key phrases like click, click here and I think read more. So if you have that exact phrasing as a link, it'll detect that. But if you have something other, a general link like read, read this article or, or click, without saying click here, it's not gonna detect that because it's just running through a, a pre-programmed -pro list of things to look out for. So you still could have link, vague link text within your course that's not gonna be picked up by this report. So just something to keep in mind, again, that this report is not gonna pick up necessarily all issues. Um, it'll pick up if a table does not have table headers, uh, though there seems to be an error in the tool recently where even if it, even if a table does have uh, table header like this one does here. It's still coming up in the report. So for that reason, I would say this tool currently is not super useful when it comes to checking tables since it will just uh, bring up a list of every table in the course, whether or not they have um, headers or not. So that, that looks like that seems to be a bug that's been reported with the tool, but it doesn't seem like it's been fixed yet. Um, this next one is a suggestion. It will let you know if you have a page that's really long, specifically with a word count longer than 3,000 words. Uh, th again, this is not a hard and fast rule, but it's just kind of maybe pointing you in a direction of a particular page that might be a little wordy and uh, might be able to be split up into multiple pages. It'll also let you know if you have a page that has no headings on it um, to, to hopefully, especially a, a really long page like this, um, it would be good to add some headings, uh, topics in there to break up the, the text. So it's just not a wall of text. Um, for headings specifically, it'll let you know if you have text that's just bolded to look like a heading, but it's not actually styled as a real heading using the, um, the heading styles in Canvas. So if we go to this page, we will see this main heading is actually a header two up here, but this is just bold text, um, paragraph text. So you would actually want to change that to probably a, a header level three to come after the main topic. And again, it might pick up bold text that you don't, you're not trying to make a heading. So um, that's another area where, we, where you'll have to do some investigation on your own. Um, this is another color contrast issue. Um, It'll also, though, let you know if you're using color in certain ways that it thinks you might be using um, for emphasis. So if you're, if you have text that's red and you want students to pay special attention to red text, um, there should be some other method to communicate that information since not everyone can see color, can see color the same way. So it'll just key you into um, text that you've colored in different ways. And then you can go to that page and see if they're, if you're using that color for a specific purpose and there's not uh, any other way to tell that um, that text is colored for a certain reason, you would just want to add some additional context there. Um, for video content, it's not super useful. It, it seems to detect if there's a YouTube video um, with captions but it will tell you that you need manual verification re required. Um, it says it doesn't match the language of your course. I, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but it basically is 
saying that it seems there's captions on the video, but it's not sure um, if the captions are correct. So I think for this YouTube video, it is picking up the fact that there's um, auto-generated captions here, but there's not actually a real English language caption file. Um, but again, this is an e if you have a lot of videos in your course, this could be an easy way just to get a list of where all those videos are um, if you need to add captions to them at a later date. Um, I think that is the basics of the what the you do it tool will check for. So unless I miss anything, I'll pass it back over to Sonia. I think you got it, Matt. Hey Matt, we do have a question in the chat or in the Q and A um, that I thought you might be able to answer now. Um, from Robin, she asks, "What if we link to a website that comes up with errors using you do it?" That's a good point. That's something I forgot to mention. Um, it's not going to check external websites or documents. There's a section that says files, um, but what that really means is if it, if you have an HTML file, it'll check that for errors but it's not gonna check any sort of Word documents, PDFs. Um, if there's errors on an external site you're linking to, it's not able to scan that actual website. So it, it might detect there's an issue with the link itself, but it's not gonna tell you if there's any errors with the website. Um, there's other tools we can recommend, um, like the Wave tool that can, can run scans on external websites. Um, but this tool is really pretty limited to the, your Canvas content itself. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to show you that um, Instructure also put in a page level accessibility checker that you can you that is available in the rich content editor anywhere you can put in text or content in Canvas. So I don't know if you've noticed this little accessibility icon, but that is there and it has some functionality. So I'm just gonna run it on this test page that we created. Um, so it, it picks up that this image right here um, doesn't have any alt text. If the image had had a, it, the file name, it would also catch that. So um, I can put in alt text in there. If it's decorative, again, I have that option to check it as decorative instead. So then you just make your changes and hit next and then it's identifying that this table doesn't have a caption so you can put in a table caption and um, apply that and then it says there's no headers so if you click that arrow it'll give you options you can select header row header column or both in this case I want a header row so I'm going to apply that and then it picks up the color contrast issues. So I'm just going to change the color and apply, change the color, apply. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. So it wants me to add all text again. Oh my. I think you might have hit next without applying that one. <laughs> Thanks. All right, let's make it decorative and apply that. And then it'll say there are no issues. Um, and I wish that was true, but it's not. I'm going to hit save here for a second. Okay, so there actually are some issues on this page. If you notice, this link text is not at all what it should be. Um, and then if we look at this, this page name is always going to be the heading level one. This heading is heading level three. Um, it shouldn't skip heading levels. So this should actually be a heading level two. Um, and then this should be a heading, but it's just bold tech or it, it's heading level four. I was playing with this earlier. But if it, that were bold text, it wouldn't catch that either. Um, and let's see, that's it. But it, so it doesn't check everything. Um, did we have a question about if you add an image to a page? So I can show you what happens. Let's see. 
just add this image. So when you're adding an image to the page, this is the alt text um, is automatically the image file name. So you would always want to change that at this point um, or mark it as decorative when you're uploading. That's not what I want to do. Okay, let me cancel out of that. So the last thing that I want to show you is also, well, the other thing I'll mention is this checker doesn't, it completely ignores video content. So this is the last thing I want to show you is this table we created. And over here are the elements, those key practices we talked about, good heading structure, meaningful links, tables with capture, captions and headers, described images, good color contrast, video captions, and page length. And so then we have a list of, you know, you do it, we'll check all of those things. Um, it is not as useful for headings. Um, it does flag the bold text, as Matt said, and then um, the page level checker um, does, it checks a few heading level errors. If you made the first heading level in H2 and the next one in H4, it would catch that and tell you to change the heading level. It ignores link text. It will, um, it's very useful for tables. We actually tell people create your table and then run the checker so you can add your caption headers because that's very hard to do in the rich content editor without that help. And then um, it will, it does a nice job with the alt text um, and it flags the contrast issues. So both tools are useful in different ways and all require you to kind of know what accessibility is so that you can make good choices. So that is what we had to share with you today. Um, there is sharing. another question in the Q&A from Stephen. Um, he uses color highlighting a lot and would like to know how a colorblind person would prefer um, that things are highlighted. Well, we say if you're using color, it just can't be the only way for somebody to have to understand the content. So if you look at your page in grayscale, does it still make sense? And if it doesn't, then you need to add another style, whether you're maybe you're also bolding the text or also italicizing it. Um, just making sure you're not relying on that color is the only way for some somebody to know something. Does that answer that question? Yes, Stephen said that yeah. answered the question, so yeah. thank you. Using color um, to associate ideas um, as an enhancement is a great idea. All right, we still have two minutes left. So if anybody else has any last minute questions for Matt and Sonia, go ahead and you do have a couple minutes to type them in. Um, so I'll just hold on another minute. And then if not, we'll go ahead and, and switch things over to Elizabeth. We just had one came in that says, um, what do you use for emphasis if not bold or italics? Those are fine to use for emphasis um, in context. Um, there, we, we just say don't use those um, in terms of creating like a heading structure. And one more came in, which checker do you use, which checker do you recommend using first? I think you do it gives you a good high level view of the whole course. Um, if you are working on a specific page, um, it might, it might be easier just to use the in page editor, but I, I like the ability to save a report um, for the whole course. So it might be something that good, good to run a few times as you're working on your course. 
What do you think, Sonia? Yeah, I would agree. I would I would say it's a good idea to use the page level checker when you're authoring in a specific page. And then when the course is completely done, then you might run you do it to get a good overview. All right, great. Thank you so much, Matt and Sonia. We just hit 1.30, so, and all the questions have been answered that came in, so we really appreciate your time. Um, we'll go ahead, um, Elizabeth, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and share your screen.